officially time to start the class, so I will um, introduce our guest lecturer for today, uh, Dr. Joe Andrew Steed from the National University of Singapore. And uh, he is a specialist in energy security, energy investments by China, particularly. And he is going to be talking to us today about how the Belt and Road Initiative may have changed the pattern of Chinese energy investments overseas and uh, reforms within the energy system in China itself. Uh, he has been in Singapore for eight years. Yes. And before that, uh, well, I think there was a hiatus of a couple of years, uh, but before that, he was for a fairly extended period at the University of Dundee, which is in what country? Anybody know? Australia. Australia. <laughs> Australia. <laughs> well, I think that there is a Dundee in New Zealand, I think, but uh, this is the original Dundee uh, in Scotland. <laughs> And uh, well, the, the city of Scotland that was uh, voted recently the most livable city in the, in the country. In any case, um, he will uh, present to you, and of course, feel free to ask him questions and make comments. So, okay, all you want. Okay, can I check? Uh, can can people hear me all right? Yeah. Yes. You're in the classroom, no problem at all. Okay. Um, the acoustics from the classroom are not very good, so I. When a student asks a question, they're going to have to take their mask off. Otherwise, it's all blurred. OK, so I will kick in um, just to say that I, I used to be an oil exploration geologist. And that was I first went to China in 1982. And then I lived in China from 1990 to 1994 as a geologist and then moved out of geology into the academic sphere of energy policy. So the 30 years that I'm going to talk about, because to understand China's external engagement uh, in energy, uh, we need to look at 30 years, because then you will understand how important or how unimportant the Belt and Road has been to the energy sector. OK, so I'm going to share my screen now. Let's hope this works. Okay, let's get rid of that. Okay, so is that all right? Is that visible? Yes. Yes. Okay, so how and why have patterns of China's outbound energy investment changed under BRI? Note it's under BRI, not because of BRI. Okay, this is a very important distinction. And I'm going to start, as it were, with my conclusions, um, uh, which are observations of what's been going on over the last 30 years or more in some cases um, in just two slides. So I'm going to share you my message and then systematically go through some of the evidence and, and then we can discuss it, or if you want a question in the middle, raise your hand. I don't know how uh, Barry organizes it, uh, but keep, keep a lookout, Barry, for questions, because I can't see everybody that's online or in the classroom. Okay, so the story in brief. So what I, this is very simplified, but um, I think simple is good sometimes, okay? So we've got the the three decades, the 90s, the 2000s, and the 2010, up, up to the present day. Fossil fuels, hydro dams, thermal power, power grids, nuclear energy, wind and solar technology, minerals, okay? So this is very schematic to show small getting bigger or whatever, uh, or sometimes getting smaller again. So fossil fuel imports. Um, basically oil and then gas as we'll go into and coal. They were very small in the 1990s, particularly oil and gas has just got bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay. Then fossil fuels, OFDI, Overseas Foreign Direct Investment and the provision of services, oil field services. That started in, in the early 90s uh, when I was in Beijing and it grew steadily um steadily until 2013 and we'll come back to what happened then 
and it's gradually started to pick up again. Um, then we've got uh, hydro dams construction that goes back to the Mao era, the, the, the 1960s, and then it's gradually been picking up. Now, the big change that obviously hits you from this diagram. Oh, God, sorry, somebody's phoned me. I don't know why I need to get rid of that. Somebody go away. It should show that I'm busy. Um, so um, is the big change is the shift from the fossil fuels and dams into electricity. So you've got thermal power plants and power grids, uh, overseas foreign direct investment and construction picking up from the, the 2000s, nuclear energy picking up in the last few years, wind and solar starting in the 2000s and picking up, exporting equipment particularly, and some foreign direct investment. Technology minerals, these are the minerals that are needed for modern energy technology, nickel, chromium, uh, rare earth elements, which are mainly in China, as we've got lithium and tantalum and other stuff like that. Okay, So the electricity story has really picked up since uh, 2009, 10, 11, whatever. And now at the bottom, I've indicated this is where the go out policy started. But the oil companies were already going out. And this is when BRI came in and the power companies were already going out. So that is the, is the big picture uh, in very simple terms. OK, so why do companies go out? Why do Chinese companies go out? And I've got the same classifications down here. Um, do they go out for the resource? I mean, that was the big story for oil and gas. Uh, and the answer is yes, but that's not critical because if you've got an oil field in Angola and Venezuela, it's a long way from home. And if there's a major war, you're not going to be able to get it back to China. So it's there, particularly in the near abroad, the, say the Soviet, former Soviet Union. Hydro dams, power grids, yeah, there was a thought that some of the dams and the grids in Southeast Asia, the Mekong River, could bring the electricity back to China uh, if necessary. In fact, now it's going to be the other way around. The one item that is different here is these technology minerals. And I think a lot of that is going to be mined in Africa, particularly, or Latin America, to be brought back to China to support its new energy uh, industries, because some of these minerals are not abundant in China. The big drivers are basically business, markets for investments, to build projects, to get out of China, build themselves, the companies build themselves international businesses, and markets to deliver products, um, such as uh, solar or wind power projects, pipelines, grids or whatever, and services, oil field services, uh, maintenance services and whatever. So, so for most of the categories, these are the big drivers, okay? Markets for investment, to make money, to sell products, to sell services. And then there's another strategic assets, getting hold of technology and skills. And I think particularly in the oil and gas industry, uh, in the, in the last 15 years, they've been trying to get into projects that are technologically advanced, such as shale gas, deep water oil and gas in the Atlantic, so they can go, they go with an international partner to learn how to do it. The same with nuclear energy, and particularly with wind and solar, uh, to, to buy into companies with strong R&D capability uh, to, to take their solar and wind technology to, to the technological frontier. So again, very simplified, but if ever you're looking at why is a Chinese company, particularly an energy company or resource company going overseas, you have, to, don't, you know, it's not just for the resource. You know, they are companies who are looking for business. 
uh, with the one exception possibly of the technology minerals. So, so that is in very simple terms, my story. And if you go back to that, my argument would be that in the energy sector, by and large, the BRI has not made a huge difference to trends that were already there. Now, there may be certain countries, certain projects that have been eased by the BRI, but if you look at the big picture, the BRI is, okay, it's something that happened, it makes life a bit easier, and, and okay, we can borrow money more easily, but it's not, it doesn't change the big picture. Okay, so th that's the simple story, the overview, now the detail. Okay, so for the oil, we need to look at the history of uh, imports. And uh, it's interesting, I've got a book written in the uh, early 1980s by an American who was very concerned that China might join OPEC, right? The oil exporting countries, because in the 1980s, China was a major exporter of crude oil. However, the demand started to grow. And so you can see the blue line here, crude imports started to rise. Uh, crude exports started to decline to almost nothing. And in 1993, China became a net importer of oil. And this was a critical time for China because uh, the major oil company, CMPC then, the, the leader had been promising that China was going to produce ever more and more oil. Well, sorry, that never happened. So lots of Im crude oil import, lots of product, that means diesel, gasoline, whatever import. And you will note that there's a lot of product export now. Why? Because they built a whole lot of refineries, more refineries than they need. So they're exporting the product. But the key for us is this 1993 date. So where does all this crude oil come from? OK, so this is the graph of crude oil imports here. This is percentage, Middle East, 40 to 50 percent the whole time. OK, thus China's strategic interest in the Middle East. Africa comes and goes. Asia Pacific is Indonesia, Malaysia, Australia. That disappears. Eurasia is mainly the former Soviet Union. That is pretty important now. And the Americas. So China has diversified its imports uh, pretty extensively, which is very sensible, but like the rest of us, uh, they depend heavily on the Middle East. Natural gas. Uh, when I worked in Beijing in the early 1990s, uh, if ever we thought there was going to be gas to be found, we would ask the Chinese oil company, what can we do with the gas? The answer is make fertilizer. Uh, if you make fertilizer from natural gas, you don't make any money. So it was thank you, goodbye. Anyway, in the late 1990s, China started to realize the value of natural gas, particularly in the cities, because it was cleaner than coal for the heating. Okay, But again, there's not enough natural gas in China. And so 2006, they started their first imports of liquefied natural gas by ship coming into Guangdong. And then gradually more and more pipelines. And so you've got a huge quantity of natural gas. So it is now the second largest importer of LNG since 2017 after Japan. And I forgot to say in the previous one, uh, 2019, China's oil imports are very close to those of the whole of Europe. So this it is a very major importer of oil and of gas. Again, if we look at the sources of China's gas imports, started Australia, Southeast Asia, then we start to see the former Soviet Union, the Commonwealth of Independent States building up, and again, Southeast Asia and Australia. So less diversified, uh, but today there is an excess of LNG uh, capacity. Obviously, the CIS is mainly pipelines. The other ones is LNG. And here, 
is, is it isn't in the slides that I sent last week because I suddenly realized this morning we didn't have a map. And here are some of it's a little out of date, but we've got uh, pipelines coming in, in green gas pipelines from Central Asia, particularly mm. Turkmenistan, oil pipelines through Kazakhstan, but also carrying some Russian oil. We have a Russian oil pipeline coming here. We have a new Russian gas pipeline coming down here. Sorry. And we have gas and oil pipelines coming through Myanmar um, into Yunnan. OK, so it's China has spent a lot of money on pipelines from the near abroad to bring oil and gas into the country. OK, so that's imports. But still, I think it's very important to, to, to put that story there, because that's what lies behind these destinations of upstream investments by China's national oil companies. And these are all the countries that they have invested in. Now, I started building this table probably about 20 years ago. It got it was small and then it got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, it started, they started investing in the early 1990s in small projects in Peru, Canada, and Papua New Guinea. And then they moved across the world. Um, and in bold, I've indicated those countries that are most important, but they're in Iraq. They're also spent time in Iran. And what was interesting, as I mentioned before, was that they gradually got more sophisticated. So if I was giving this presentation in 2010, there would be very few under the Americas, okay? But then they realized they need, there was lots of oil and gas in the Americas. Uh, fiscal and legal conditions were relatively stable. They could learn new technologies. So they started to invest in the Americas. So there's about 50 countries there. Now, in many cases, they have now withdrawn from some of these investments, but that's very difficult to keep track of. The Chinas will always shout and beat their chest where they have a new investment, they keep very quiet uh, when they sell an investment. So I am not up to date with where they've divested their interests. So this is a huge amount of investment. Tens, sorry, probably up to 200 billion US dollars was spent. Okay, that's a lot of money. And this is a very good graph put together by Erica Downs, who watches this space now much more closely than I do, of her estimates of Chinese overseas acquisitions by national oil companies from 2009 and 2013, 40 billion in one year alone. Now, I remember in 2008, 2009, I had a lunch with an old student of mine who was very senior in PetroChina, CMPC. And I said to him, what does the global recession mean for you? And he said, huge opportunity to buy assets at low prices. And so you can see this, yeah. And then what happened in 2013, 2014? Xi Jinping came to power, yeah, and uh, was looking for corrupt people and he found the biggest and most corrupt people in the national oil companies. Uh, so that combined with the oil price crash meant that, yeah, overseas investment just stopped. No, everybody was too, either had been put in prison, was on their way to prison, or were too frightened to do anything. Uh, there was a story at one stage that uh, any, every senior manager in PetroChina would be phoned twice a day. If they didn't pick up their phone, it was assumed that they were on their way to being arrested and therefore their office would be cleared. So in that sort of environment, you don't make bold decisions. But as you can see, it started to pick up from 2018, 19, and the decisions got a little more sober. I mean, this was, it may have been corruption, but this was over exuberance. This was a company with too much money throwing it around because the boss at the time wanted to show how great he was. Uh, he ended up in jail. So that's the oil and gas story broadly. Coal, 
as you know, China is a major, it has huge amounts of coal. Coal provides 65% of all of its energy, but it still imports coal. Okay, though this varies from year to year, depending on exact coal policies at the time. Uh, but 20%, about 20% of internationally traded coal goes to China. And in the past, some Chinese companies have invested in coal uh, fields overseas, but this isn't terribly big. So I'm gonna whiz back to our first slide. So I've tried to take you through this story, okay? Imports growing of fossil fuels, overseas foreign investment growing, crashing and then building up slowly. And again, services. The oil companies in China have huge service industries, drilling, seismic laboratories, whatever. And they also all over the world delivering their oil field services. Okay, electrical power. So this is the new story, okay, that if we were talking 10 years ago, we would hardly mention. China, most of its electricity still comes from coal. Okay, you will have read about that, but you'll have read that they're trying to use less coal and more renewable energy and nuclear, hydro, solar, wind, etc. So the companies that build coal fire power stations need business. So you need new business. What do you do? You go overseas. Okay, and that's again what the oil and gas companies did because not much oil and gas reserves at home. So we go overseas to build the business. But also, and they're building coal fire power plants because that's what they're very good at. Um, now, what's interesting, if you followed the newspapers in the last two or three years, a lot of banks, international uh, organizations, national banks, etc., around the world are no longer financing coal fired power stations. Okay, so China is one of the few remaining countries that supply and will provide loans for coal fired power plants. Okay, so if a country doesn't have its own money, or its power companies don't have its own money, its banks don't have any money, and you want a coal fired power plant, what do you do? You go to China. Um, now, China has some of the most advanced, it has built more of the most advanced coal-fired power plants in the world than any other country. But many, and these are called ultra supercritical, it just means very efficient, very big, uh, but many of the plants that they're building around the world are subcritical, which means they are less efficient and less clean. Why? Because that's what their host can afford to buy. Uh, they're also building some gas-fired power plants, but not very many. Um, and particularly these, coal, these thermal power plants are going into Africa and Southeast Asia, which is where I am. Now, the, the, the asterisk is just a little note that Chinese companies were contracted about 30% of greenfield power plant uh, uh, construction during this five-year period in Africa. OK, that's uh, hydro and thermal. So these are they are very big players now on the international scene. So hydroelectricity, China is the world's largest builder of dams, and it goes back to the 1960s in Africa, a small number of dams built by the Chinese then. And you know, it's, it's since the 1990s, it's been building again financed by China's Exim Bank and other non-Chinese sources. Again, Africa, Southeast Asia are big destinations, particularly in the Mekong River and in Myanmar next door, and Pakistan, Iran, Central Asia, and other places. So most of the hydro projects are not investments. These are just construction projects. We construct it and we go. The thermal power, some are investment, some are pure construction. Uh, 
Now we get to more modern things, power grids, okay? This is the transmission grids that countries have to link the power generation to the people who use it. And in the last five or 10 years, the, the big, the, okay, in China, there are two grid companies, the Southern China Grid, which covers four provinces, and the state grid company of China, which is huge, which covers all the other 26 provinces. It's a huge company. It has bought into the grids of Portugal, Brazil, it's bought grid systems in Australia, Philippines, Italy, Greece, etc. It's constructing in Africa and Southeast Asia. Now, what's interesting about the grid company is that almost unique in the companies that we've talked about, it is the only grid company in the world that has developed and commercialized ultra high voltage transmission. OK, this means that you can transmit electricity over thousands of kilometers, but without losing. Because if you transmit electricity, you, you have line losses, okay? So ele the electricity is just lost. And you, know, you can lose over large distances, two, three, four, six percent if the grid is badly managed. But with this technology, uh, in large countries like China, where they've already built a number of ultra high voltage transmission grids and Brazil, another very large country, uh, you can build these systems and you it's much more efficient. So they are really world leaders, the only people building systematically ultra high voltage transmission. Nuclear energy, again, if you read the newspapers, you will have read that China has not, it doesn't have the largest nuclear fleet in the world, but it has the fastest growing nuclear fleet in the world, power fleet. And it will soon be, in a few years, the biggest in the world. Um, they are doing this. They've been working on nuclear for 40, 50 years. They, they produced their own bomb back in the 50s, I think. And then they moved into nuclear energy. But that has become big recently. One, as an industry to be exploited and sold overseas. Two, energy self-sufficiency. And three, non-carbon or low carbon, not air polluting uh, energy. Though, of course, nuclear has its other problems, but that's not part of this story. So they've got plants under construction in Pakistan. They're planning in Argentina and Romania and this potential in, in these other countries. But unlike Russia, which is, uh, if you again, you may spot it in the newspapers, Russia is actively building nuclear power plants in a number of countries, such as Bangladesh, and Turkey, and whatever. Um, China's going much more slowly. And you might have noticed that China is in the United Kingdom in a joint venture with the French power company, EDF, to build and are building today a nuclear power plant in the West of country. It's not a Chinese project. China is just a minor joint venture partner, but that is part of the learning process and part of the sort of building reputation process. But again, they have their own design of nuclear power plant that they will hope to be selling around the world. So they're not necessarily the leaders in nuclear power, but they are pretty close to the technological frontier. And not only with today's technologies, but with tomorrow's technologies, uh, small modular reactors, generation four reactors, which won't have any risk, won't have any waste, etc. So these are two industries where China is likely to end up as a major player across the world. Power grids, definitely nuclear energy, probably unless the whole world goes against nuclear. So solar. Uh, this is a slightly old graph, but it gives you the feeling of exports. OK, so in the last 10 years, China has become a major exporter of uh, solar modules, which is the thing that you put on your roof, the cell, which is what makes up the modules and the wafers which go into the solar cells and also wind turbines. But it's the solar business where China's become 
the major supplier uh, across the world. Not necessarily the most sophisticated, but reasonably priced, reasonably good quality stuff. So here you are. They were exporting solar since 2004. Why? Because people started making the stuff, but the government had not put in place the incentives to uh, implement and install within China. So they, they, the factories started making because they thought the solar boom is coming. They had to sell it overseas. There was huge overcapacity, so they were selling below cost. And so there were WTO trade disputes around 2011, uh, after which the government came in and, and, and then put in uh, incentives for domestic deployment. So they were able to sell more in the domestic market. But, you know, the world was going green. And so they were still able to export overseas. Not only that, they started to, they'd started to manufacture overseas, partly because of the trade disputes. Okay, don't buy, if you buy panels, the European thing was, there was a minimum price for panels from China, but if you make them in Vietnam or Malaysia, then maybe the minimum price doesn't hold. Uh, they were also, as I mentioned before, buying Western uh, PV technology companies in order to get more advanced technology and got involved in deploying overseas as investments as well. And exports started to pick up again from 2015. So solar is the big thing. This, this is just business. It's got nothing to do with, um, uh, you know, government strategies or anything. It's selling stuff. It is manufacturing overseas. It is investing in projects overseas. Wind has moved more slowly um, when it comes to exports, partly because the wind technology was uh, able to be installed domestically before the solar. Okay, but you see back in 2008, China's gold wind buys Vinces, which was a major European wind company for the technology. And by 2011, Supply from the turbine factories in China exceeded domestic demand, and so exports started to grow. Okay, so similar, but wind less dominant, solar a really important player globally. Finally, technology mineral extraction. Okay, so we got the rare earth metals, uh, which China dominates that market. It has a lot of its own, but the key is that it produces it at very low cost, and so it can sell it at very low cost. So although there are rare earth metal deposits in Australia and, and, and America and other places, they can never, they can't be viable on a purely commercial basis because the Chinese will always undercut them. And this has become a major strategic issue for the West because you need them for an awful lot of stuff today, modern energy equipment. Uranium for nuclear energy, China has some, but not enough, but it has it's been mining in Namibia, Africa and Kazakhstan for some years to bring the, the nuclear, the uranium ore back to China. And then we've got lithium, cobalt and nickel which are all vital components for batteries and Chinese companies are involved in mining for this. And, uh, you know, this is in order to take the product back, or at least a lot of the product, maybe not all of it, back to China to feed into the battery supply chains there because China has huge ambitions in the new energy space whether it be batteries or electric cars or, or hydrogen or whatever. So, so these, this is what I call the technology minerals. And these are the one product that we're talking about that I believe is explicitly exploited in order to take back to China. So a couple of slides to round off. How and why have patterns of China's outbound energy investment changed under BRI? Okay, 
How? Okay, so I answer it in two ways. How is this more discerning investment in oil and gas? Okay, so they're not throwing away $40 billion a year anymore. Lower oil prices, uh, experience, because they've wasted an awful lot of money uh, in, on some of their investments, and the anti-corruption drive together has brought a degree of sobriety to the leadership of the national oil companies. But the more important, how? It's the change in balance between the fossil fuels and the electrical power industries. Um, so that's one we've seen uh, that, but the electrical power industries were coming anyway. So, you know, the, the, that's, so, but that balance has now changed. Also the import, uh, we've seen a change of balance between purely importing energy raw materials and exporting of technology, construction services, and manufacturing. Okay, so if we go back 10 or 15 years, China was just interested in bringing stuff back. Uh, now it is sending out technologies, services, building manufacturing capacity overseas. Okay, so, so there's, there's a big change there. Why? Growing technological expertise, particularly in the electricity field, and excess manufacturing and construction capacity. Now, I know those of you read about BRI, one of the reasons was to export excess manufacturing and construction capacity, fine. But this was already happening in the electricity industries before BRI. So BRI in the energy electricity sector was after the event. So, Standing back, what have I? What have we seen? We've seen a 25 or more year program of internationalization of Chinese energy companies, mainly state-owned enterprises, but not always, particularly in the renewable space. Strong state support in most cases, uh, either financial, or political, or what, particularly through the state banks. The main motivation is business development. I mean, that's it. Investing to make money, selling equipment, selling services, etc. The main driver has been the changes in the domestic market combined with technological advance. First fossil fuels, then electrical power. So for me, BRI has probably only had a modest influence on corporate decisions and behaviors in the energy field. I mean, you know, it was all happening anyway, and Xi Jinping says, yeah, let's go out, then fine. Everybody, you know, feels good about going out. And some companies that might not have gone out is now going out. Uh, but that, to me, doesn't change the big picture of what was happening all along. So I shall stop there, and we can take questions, comments, observations, or whatever.